Hello and welcome to the School of Science Overview Programme from XJTLU. My name is Dr Graham Dawson, I'm from the Department of Chemistry. So these are the programmes that are available in the School of Science. We have BSCs in Applied Mathematics, Biological Sciences, Bioinformatics, Applied Chemistry, Environmental Science, Financial Mathematics, Actuarial Science, and then we also have three uh, master's level programmes, MRES in uh, Molecular Bioscience and Advanced Chemical Sciences, and an MSc in Financial Mathematics. So I'm going to give you a brief overview of the school as a whole, and then uh, something a little bit about the staff. So we have some accreditation within the school. With a chemistry degree, the BSc is accredited by the Royal Society of Chemistry, the British Chemistry Society. This is the first in China to be awarded this accreditation. Then the Royal Society of Biology accredited the uh, Biological Sciences degree. This was also the first in mainland China and the second anywhere in the world outside of the UK. The Actuarial Sciences degree is also accredited uh, to all these accreditation bodies, I'm sorry I don't really know what they are, um, UGAS uh, by VE and UCAP from SOA. I'm sure if you're interested in that subject you know what these things mean. So what do we have in the School of Sciences? Uh, what facilities do we have? Well we have lots of equipment for research and teaching, lots of lab space. This is from Environmental Sciences and you have uh, uh, some information on the equipment and the lab space there some excellent uh, labs. Within environmental sciences they also have an interesting uh, learning and teaching experience involving field trips, lab experiments, investigations and computer simulations. At biological sciences they have a, a large equipment base uh, greater than 55 million RMB funding. Uh, here is some mass spec. These are the chemistry teaching labs the large space, lots of bench space, lots of fume cupboard space where we teach all our undergraduate modules. We also have a research lab where people like myself do are, are active in research and we have PhD and master students and final year project students in the uh, research lab. And a modern financial laboratory for your financial mathematics uh, degree as well. So when students graduate from HJTLU they go on to study at some of the top universities in the world. We have some information on career opportunities here. The first one is chemistry. So we think of chemistry as the central science involved in everything. And there's lots and lots of uh, industries and um, then and companies you can work in here, BP, Pfizer, GSK. And lots of these companies have offices, research and development offices in the Suzhou, Shanghai area. The Department of Environment, Health and Environmental Science also offers a public health degree, uh, so there's lots of opportunities for employment in public health in the future, as well as a growing area. The last one here, I think, is in actuarial science. Lots of people studying this actuarial science don't have to become actuaries in the future. There's lots and lots of areas for employment within actuarial science. I have some program information which I'm going to skip through, but will be available on the PPT because they're very specific to the programs. Uh, here you can do some different areas for environmental science. So if you are interested in one of these programs you can pause the video and have a look at that. So just environmental science, here's financial mathematics, the program structure uh, involving some computer science, economics and maths as well. Okay so that's uh, a brief introduction to the School of Sciences. There's a lot of information in those slides that you can go back and pause if you're interested in more detail. So thank you very much. Hello and welcome to a demo lecture on colour and energy. My name is Dr Graham Dawson from the Department of Chemistry. So what we're going to talk about today, a few th topics, is energy and the current uses of energy, how that affected by colour, the current state of affairs in China and in the world, and maybe some future solutions to that. So currently, industrialised societies are all using fossil fuels, so coal, gas and oil. And these are having a major effect on global temperatures. So here we have the world uh, temperature rising uh, from the 80s up to now and the famous picture you'll often see of that is of the polar bear on the ice caps. So this has recently got a lot of attention especially in America on whether this uh, data is, is true and we're not going to talk about that today but I think the scientific consensus is that we are causing global warming. So I want to talk a little bit about alternative sources of energy for that. Now, first thing is, this is a major, major world problem. But we can look back on problems that chemists have created and then solved as something that, that can give us hope. 
So, the first, so we're going to talk about CFCs. So CFCs uh, were used in refrigerators. They're fantastic chemicals. They're so stable and inert, and that's why they were used in fridges. But we later found out that these cause the hole in the ozone layer. So they're not used anymore. Now at the bottom of the slide here is a couple of examples of CFCs, chemical structures. The reason that they caused the hose, hole in the ozone layer is because they were so inert. They rose up through the stratosphere and through photolysis with ozone, uh, they depleted the ozone. And this is centered around the uh, poles of the Earth. But in the, um, the late 80s, the Montreal uh, Protocol was enacted through environmentalists working with chemists and banning the use of CFCs. So that since then, the levels of ozone have started to stabilise and they're projected to be at pre-1980 levels before 2075. This is fantastic. I think this is a real success story. There was a, a problem uh, that we created through no malicious intent, just through trying to do something better with CFCs. Then we saw the problem and we're going to correct it. So there is hope that we can do this and the whole world can work together on this and science. Before we talk about other energy sources, I want to talk a little bit about colour. How does colour impact this? Well, the colour of an object is a complex result of many things. A couple of them are listed on this slide here. It's surface properties, it's transmission and emission properties, and all of these things contribute to the mix of wavelengths and light that leave the surface of an object. This is something I hope you are familiar with. The visible spectrum it contains all the range of wavelengths that are visible to the human eye. So at 400 nanometers down we have the blue spectrum going up through the green and yellow up to red at 700 nanometers. And this is split through the prism, uh, the air into its com uh, light into its component parts. Now, we see examples of this. Uh, I'm originally from Scotland uh, where it feels like it rains every day. So we often see rainbows. I have lived in Sujo over 10 years and I think I've seen a rainbow maybe twice. So I mean, hopefully this is familiar to you. So we can see that the index of refraction of many materials varies slightly with wavelength. And we can see that how you form uh, rainbows. Now, um, I have a question to ask you. Um, so which of these will absorb more energy, black or white? And I'm not sure we're gonna do this. Um, we would say black, right? Excellent, black absorbed more energy. Right? So that's a simple question. I've got a shot. Simple question. Um, so then, if black absorbs more energy, why do the Bedouin, a tribe a de of desert-loving people in Africa, why do they wear black robes? So if I ask you a simple question now, if we were in a classroom, I would be asking you this: um, Which of these colours absorbs more energy, black or white? Which one do you think? I hope you said black. Uh, if it's a sunny day, you would wear a white t-shirt rather than a black t-shirt because white reflects the light, but black absorbs. Right? So bearing that in mind, why do the Bedouin tribe in Africa wear black robes? I'll give you maybe think about this. Um, what kind of reasons can you have for this? So often the students would uh, respond to me that maybe it's fashion or some form of religious, uh, cultural experience that they have to wear black. That's, that's maybe interesting. Maybe it's cultural. Um, often students say that they, 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 they just want to be warm. It's too cold at night. That's another good example. But the reason I'm asking you this question is it's about controlling an experiment, which is very, very important in science, because it's the wind that cools them down. So the wind in the desert cools them down in their loose robes quicker than the sun heats them. And again, the reason to tell, talk about this is because we need to be able to control and change one variable in a scientific experiment for it to be valid. Hopefully, if you come and study uh, anything in the School of Science or Chemistry, uh, then that's a very, very important lesson, that we need to control one variable in an experiment. Let me ask you, um, can you read the numbers on this slide? I hope you can. I hope you can see on the left-hand side, uh, 45, 6 and 12. As I get older, the 12 is the only one I can really clearly read now. And I always blame the screen, but I think I actually need to go and see my optician. Right. So hopefully, if you can see all those three numbers, fantastic. If you can't, please make an appointment with your ophthalmologist. Now, the next, the other picture on this slide is something that was quite famous a few years ago. 
what color is this dress? What color do you see in this dress? Is it gold or is it blue and black? Now, um, I have tested this out and about half the people I show it to think it's one color, half the people think it's other. I see it as gold. Um, but the important point here is that color also depends on the perception from our brains. It's not just an, a, a definable thing for in a love case. So, I am from the Department of Chemistry, so we do want to put a little bit of chemistry in here as well. So we want to talk about the chromophore, is the region in a molecule where the energy difference between two molecular orbitals falls in the range of the visible spectrum, so that the light emitted from the molecule is in the visible range. So here's a good example, beta-carotene, which is the red-orange pigment in red and orange fruit, so carrots, squashes, peppers, things like that. And you see the, the large amount of conjugation. What does conjugation mean? It means alternate double and single bonds. So we have double, single, double, single, double, single. In this case, in a long chain. Often in colored molecules, it's formed from ring systems, as you can see at the top of the slide there. So we have, in this case, we have a redshift going from left as you're looking to right, so from 200 to 500 nanometers. Then with the more conjugation, that absorption peak shifts to the right, and this is a red shift, shifting towards the red uh, part of the spectrum. Uh, conversely, if it shifts the other way, that's a blue shift, and that's um, something that happens a lot in my research area. When we take a, a material and we make it smaller, then we get what's called the quantum confinement effect and a blue shift in the absorbent spectrum. So why is this important? Well, um, dyes, uh, where dye industry was the forebearer of the chemical industry, dye, uh, blue is a very sought after colour because it's not common in nature. It's one way of doing this. Uh, indigo, uh, the blue colour in jeans, which I hope you can see clearly, uh, is from a, a bean plant. But the fresh plants don't appear blue. After fermentation under alkaline conditions, followed by oxidation, that turns blue. Now, that's probably quite a complicated uh, sentence to deconstruct. Fermentation under alkaline conditions, followed by oxidation. What do we mean? Well. What normally happened is it was because this was uh, discovered by a lot of different cultures around the same time. Is that you were eating your dinner near the fire, and then you put the fire out, but you didn't want to waste your drinking water. So how do you put the fire out? You go to the toilet on the fire, and that puts the fire out. Then you have the conditions of fermentation under alkaline conditions and oxidation, and you see the blue colour appear, and that's why this was discovered in many different cultures at the same time. Here's the chemical uh, scheme for this, and this is the blue colour indigo in genes. Mostly. This is another example, a double bond, single bond, double bond, single bond. This is saffron. It's the most expensive spice in the world. It's very labour intensive. Um, in India, they use it for cooking. In Western China, they use it in tea. Um, so this is a very expensive natural spice. It's the most expensive in the world. And the colour comes from this molecule, which is conjugation, double bond, single bond, double bond. We're looking at dyes, in, uh, or talking about dyes, sorry, and compare that to pigments. What's the, what are the, what's the difference? Well, a pigment is something that needs to be applied, it doesn't stick naturally onto material. So if you have a look at here, an example is a blue pigment. So this absorbs red and green, and blue is uh, reflected and appears. So one of my colleagues kindly gave me an one of their paintings to use. So we can see here the pigments and the paint, the acrylic paints, and you have very vivid, bright colours coming from, from this, and you can layer it very thick. We have greens and blues. And these materials, they absorb the complementary colours, and what you see is what's reflected. So here is an example. Um, the red line is a red pigment, and the green line is a green pigment. Now, if you look at the absorbance, then the red pigment absorbs across the spectrum, but not in the red region of the spectrum. So that's why it appears red. And this has uses in everyday. And these paints used now are made from the chemical industry. Whereas at the time of Rubens, the painting, uh, painter I showed you earlier, then they would, the painters would have made their own dyes from natural materials. They would have got plants or herbs, 
things like that to make their own own dice. So you can look at like kind of old masters and painters, their colours will be different and they may have faded over the years. That's because they all made their own paints and dyes rather than buying them from the shop like we can do now. Okay, so on the slide you can see the reaction of this experiment. What we're gonna do, we have some sodium hydroxide dissolved in water. I'm gonna add in some glucose. It's very humid here today, sorry. So that was stuck. And then this is methylene blue. And then the blue colour will fade in about a minute. So whilst we're waiting for that to fade, then we can look at the experiment, what's going on. Glucose is a reducing agent, so in an alkaline solution, it will reduce methylene blue to form to be colourless. Then we're going to shake it, and we're going to put oxygen back into the reaction, which will oxidise it back the other way. And this should work for a good couple of hours. And it works perfectly well in the lab, when no one's recording or filming, but then time seems to go slower when you're doing it in front of a camera, but this should fade within a minute. So the colour disappeared, then we Give it some air, oxygen, and then why do we talk about colour? Because we want to bring it back around to talking about energy, so alternative energy, so solar power and uh, artificial photosynthesis. I mentioned at the start that we were dependent on oil, natural gas, and coal in the world. Now, the infrastructure for these uh, fossil fuels is massive and probably more far-reaching than you realise. Um, we probably all understand um, the electricity and from, our, from cars, but also it's important in the fine chemical industry. And on this slide, I've also put the largest uh, polluters over the last, since 1965. Uh, so you have the big um, oil companies are all producing huge amounts of carbon dioxide through this sort of um, industry. And it's worldwide. You can see UK, um, Iran, America, um, Saudi Arabia, Shell, which it used to be, which is American now, and um, Sinopec is in there as well from China. So lots of, um, lots of countries are involved in this. And it also affects the fine chemical industry, as I said. Well, hopefully, uh, we've, you've learned something. We've talked a little bit about colour. We've talked a little bit about oil infrastructure and energy and solar power. And we've done a wee demo on oxidation and reduction. So, thank you very much for listening.